Good morning, family and friends. Enon, family and friends. I hope y'all had a good morning in Sunday school. We, our class certainly did. I'll share with you a, a brief statement about uh, the Sunday school class I'm in. Rob Matthews asked me several years ago if I wanted to join the senior adult men's class. I said, sure, okay, I, I'm with that. I was a little hesitant to start with. And then he told me where it's located. It's located in the last room before you get to the cemetery. <laughs> a little nervous, but we're, we're still there and we're hanging in there, growing, growing. But anyway, before I forget it, this afternoon they're having the, uh, the, the uh, uh, Pinewood Derby, the race cars, and everyone is invited to attend that big event and they'll uh, have a meal, share a meal with you. So if you, if you hadn't thought about uh, watching those races, then today would be a good day. It's a beautiful day for it. Uh, some of the announcements. Uh, this Wednesday, we will not have Wednesday uh, Bible study because it's moved to Thursday, Monday, Thursday. So that's, we're substituting, we're moving Wednesday uh, Bible study to Thursday. Keep that in mind. And uh, let's see, is there any other announcement? No, I don't think so. So uh, yes, there, yes, there is another. Remember Vacation Bible School. It'll be here before you know it. So if you're thinking about um, signing up, please do that. There's uh, a board, there's a, a, a piece of paper back here on the, on the east hallway for you to sign up to volunteer. So uh, keep that in mind, keep it in your prayers. And uh, we'll continue on. Bow with me in prayer. <clears throat> Dear God, thank you for the blessings of life. Thank you for the fellowship and the joy that we share uh, with each other, acknowledging that Jesus Christ is our Savior. Uh, be with our pastor during the 11 o'clock. Your words through his service touch someone's heart that they will recognize Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. The marketplace is empty, no more traffic in the street. All the builders' tools are silent, no more time to harvest wheat. Busy housewives cease their labor, in the courtroom no debate. Work on earth has been suspended, as the king comes through the gate happy faces line the hallway those whose lives have been redeemed broken homes that he has mended those from prison he has freed little children and the aged hand in hand and all aglow who were crippled broken ruin glad in garments white as snow
praise team is making their way up. On behalf of the Sunday School Directorship, I would like to thank everyone, including um, all the people that helped yesterday, Robbins, Williams and I, I mean Slater, sorry Robin, Robin Slater and I would like to thank everybody that helped out, Nancy Long, thank you so much, there were so many people here that helped out, that stepped in, and we had such a wonderful time with the children yesterday, so thank you all for helping out yesterday, I think we had a wonderful time together, and I think Jesus was lifted high yesterday and worshipped through our Easter egg hunt with the children, thank you. All right, we're going to invite you to stand and sing Evidence. All throughout my history Your faithfulness is walked beside me. The winter storms make way for spring. In every season, from where I'm standing, I see the evidence of your goodness all of my life. All of my life I see your promises in fulfillment All of my life All of my life Help me remember when I'm weak Fear may come but fear will leave Lead my heart to victory. You are my strength, and you always will be. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promise. All of my life, all of my life. See the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolls away, cause of you, oh Jesus. See the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus, oh. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over my life, yeah. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see Promises in fulfillment all of my life, all of my life. So why should I fear? The evidence is clear. Why?
Uh, if it would, the, let the ushers come down and we'll uh, take up an offering. Just a minute ago that uh, today is uh, a big day for us. Uh, the evidence is here. We've got a, a, new, a new pastor joining us, Mr. Ben Webb and his family seated up front here. If you get a chance, you can talk to him about uh, where he's from, and I'll share with you something that a lot of you didn't know about me. Mr. Ben and myself know exactly where White Plains, North Carolina, is located. I prime tobacco, some of you didn't know that, I prime tobacco in White Plains, North Carolina. McKinney Road, he's very familiar with it. So, uh, but I'm not sure he primed tobacco in White Plains. <laughs> I need to question him about that. But anyway, keep that in mind that uh, our, uh, God is uh, here, the evidence is here, and we hope to receive a blessing and he'll uh, grow into our lives as uh, we seek to find the blessings that God's going to uh, present to us and just keep counting your blessings. That's all we can do. Bow with me. Dear God, thank you again for the blessings of life. Thank you for being instrumental in using the funds that we uh, distribute to um, this church that we can promote the word of God and his son, Jesus Christ, who uh, is the savior of the world. Again, thank you for the blessings and, uh, and bless the people that uh, acknowledge that point and freely give to promote that. In Christ's name I pray, amen. I grew up in a ministry home. We were a part of great Baptist churches growing up and was familiar with how the Annie Armstrong offering was put to such incredible use. But growing up in Alabama, it's kind of scary to think that we were gonna come out here to try something that we had not done before, that we knew the Lord was calling us to, but didn't wanna do it alone. The context here in Las Vegas is much different than the context in Alabama, and one of that is just religious awareness. 60% of our city would identify with no religion at all. And because of that, I think we have a unique opportunity to introduce them to who Jesus is. It really makes me think of Maki's story. I met Maki for the first time. He showed up at one of our events before we launched called an invite night. My name is Maki Pizzolo. I'm a professional MMA fighter, which is a professional mixed martial arts fighter. Um, I never thought that God would love a person that fights and looks towards violence for a living. But before Favor City Church started, Joseph led me to Christ. And I would say that today, my life is blessed. I couldn't even put it into words. My guy is blessing me left and right, bro. Yeah, that's, that's legit. I didn't even know church planting was a thing until I met them, but, um, and I'm looking forward to be able to go out and help make more disciples and really turning the tides in people's lives. Yeah, so now we're in a space where we're seeing over 150 people engaging at our church. We've seen over 30 professions of faith. So the freedom that we get from the Annie Armstrong Easter offering is that we get to engage with people like my friend, Maki. We get to take our time, and then that's where we're able to see the disciple-making process happen and the church be born.
you don't clap for me when I stand up, but thank you for that. I do appreciate that. Amen. <laughs> All right. It's good to be with you this morning on this occasion as we come to install a new pastor. And uh, I know that everybody's uh, got that excitement and, and just waiting to see what the Lord is going to be doing. And certainly do. Now, before we begin this part of it, I do want to ask, and this isn't on the, what they asked me to do, but I want to ask the search committee, those that were on the search committee, if you'd please stand. Got a couple of them in here. There we are, all around. You know, when they first met close to two years ago, okay. uh, my words to them were, uh, don't be in a hurry because you don't want to just fill the pulpit and then something not go right and have to start all over. Take your time and make sure as you go along and God will lead you. It may take a year. That's what I tell all of our search committees, at least a year. And some it may take two years or longer. And so uh, they have been meeting and uh, Pastor Bill has been meeting with them some and I've met with them a couple of times. And, uh, it wasn't an easy process. And I tell that to search committees, it's not an easy process. You want to make sure you have the right person. And it's like a marriage in a sense. You have to have the right pastor match up with the right church. And if it's the right two match together, then the Lord will just continue to bless and bless and bless. So we're looking forward to that, aren't we? Amen? All right. Well, Pastor... Uh, Benjamin, if you'll stand, I'll just get you to stand right there where you are. Uh, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, and this will be sort of like a charge to you uh, on behalf of the church. And then after he answers, I will or I do, then I'm going to do the same thing to the church. I'm going to ask you to stand, and I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and then if you will, unanimously together, just say, we will. Okay? And then after we do that, I'm going to ask Pastor... Ben to come down front and the deacons to come to surround him and we're going to have a, a installation prayer and then after that it's all yours brother Ben you, 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 he, he's got that gun cocked he's ready to go amen <laughs> alright all right. Reverend Ben Webb since you have been called as pastor of this congregation of England Baptist Church and you're about to assume the uh, charge of the flock here in this place, it is fitting that you should be reminded of some of the duties of this sacred and blessed office, that you may carry them out in a manner that is fitting and faithful as a servant of the Lord. As an ambassador of Christ, you are to preach and to teach the word in pure doctrine, uh, using God's word as the sole example uh, and source, to instruct the way of salvation, to counsel those that have uh, questions and, and inquiries, to strengthen the weak, to seek the lost and to reclaim those that are straying, to comfort those that are in sorrow, to take care of those in need, to visit the sick, to minister to those that are uh, dying, and always to have in your heart a, a prayer that will help in their spiritual welfare uh, to every soul under your care. Now, are you uh, ready to devote yourself to this and to the study of the scriptures and to meditate upon God's word daily to carry out your duties uh, according to God's word and that you and your family uh, will be an example to others in godliness and Christian living, putting no stumbling block uh, before anyone on intentionally so that you may minister uh, with a way that does not discredit God or his word. As quoted from Timothy in scripture, you're to preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season to correct, to rebuke, and to encourage with great patience and careful instruction. You should aspire to keep, uh, in all situations, you're, you're to inspire to keep uh, a sense of calmness and peace, to endure hardship, to work, to do the work of an evangelist, to discharge these duties of your ministry. Also to set an example and all that you do in speech, love, in your life, faith, and in purity. And so having said that, and I know that's a lot, but I want to say to Brother uh, Ben before he says, I will or I do, every one of us in here is a minister too. So everything I'm asking him is of you as well. We're not going to ask him to do something that we're not willing to do. 
So he's going to pledge in just a minute. He's going to try to the best of his ability. And he's, he knows and I know we're sinners and we're going to do things that's not going to be pleasing to God. But we're not going to do it intentionally. Okay, so I'm not asking him all these questions and putting him up on a big pedestal and, and making him feel like he's perfect because he's not. None of us are. But he's promising to you today that he's going to do to the best of his ability to live a life that is pleasing to our Lord. Okay? So having said all that, I ask you, therefore, dear brother, in the presence of God and this congregation, are you willing to assume these responsibilities and to faithfully carry them out to the best of your ability? Amen. Now, if you'll be seated. All right. Now, members and congregation of Enon Baptist Church, if you'll stand, we're going to do use similar type of questions. Uh, there'll be a couple of these things. And so, as I ask these, brothers and sisters in Christ of Enon Baptist Church, you've heard this solemn promise given to you by Brother Ben as the man that has been called to be your pastor. I admonish and charge you, therefore, to receive him as your pastor. And always remember that uh, what the word, word of God demands of you as members of the flock. You're to be eager to hear the preaching of the word, uh, to receive it not just as a word, but the word, but that as he shares the word, that you'll listen to his admonishment, to humbly receive the word that he shares with you as God has laid it upon his heart. And that word will help those that are lost to be saved. And that you will aid him by your word and example of, of instruction to the young as he tries to reach those that are young. Remembering the exhortation to bring your children into the training and instruction of the Lord. That you'll raise your children up in the house of the Lord. That you'll honor and love him. As the Apostle Paul says, respect those who work hard among you and are over you in the Lord, and that you will hold them in the highest regard in love because uh, of the, their worth. They are a value that God has chosen them. That you will pray for him and his family continually in his labors as he continues to be a cheerful, give a cheerful spirit and in his ministry that he might be greatly blessed. That you will pray for him, that God will bless him, that in turn will bless you, bless this community, and also for the cause of Christ. That you will remember, of the script, remember the words of the scriptures that says to obey those that are over you, that you will submit to their authority to watch over you, and that you will give an account uh, of what you have heard. So we're all going to be responsible for what we hear and how it applies to our lives. So I now ask you, brothers and sisters of Eden Baptist Church, are you willing to receive Brother Ben as your pastor, as a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you willing to show him that love, honor, and obedience that the Lord requires? That he will be an overseer that has been placed here and that you will support him and pray for him as the chief shepherd and the overseer of souls. Amen. All right, amen. All right, if you'll be seated. All right. Uh, Brother Ben and, and Lindsay, if you want to come too. You come stand with him right here. So that's all the deacons. If you'll come, just make a circle around uh, this area right here. We're just going to have a prayer for, for Brother Ben and uh, praying for him as he begins the ministry here. All right. uh, uh, reason I've, we ask the deacons to come is because this is the group currently serving. And these are what we would call the assistants, in many cases, to the pastor. These will be the people that he will be working most closely with. Uh, they will be his right and left arm, if you will, helping him uh, in ministry and as they meet together. This, these will be the folks that will have the most contact with him on a daily basis or a monthly basis. But these are the people that you have selected, okay? You've chosen these men to work with the pastor. And so what we're going to do today is their presence here and their uh, surrounding uh, Brother Ben and Lindsay is to say that they support uh, him, they're going to work with him, and that we're just going to wait and just, I don't say be amazed, but we're just going to be a, uh, amazed really at what God's going to be doing. Amen? Amen. It's this sacred day. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this beautiful day. We're reminded as springtime has, has come Father, we're reminded of the newness of life. 
Just outside these doors, we see the beautiful flowers blooming, the, the, the blossoms coming on the trees because they know it's springtime. But Father, we also know that it's springtime because as we come next Sunday and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord, we are so fortunate to know as Christians the newness of life that we have in Christ. And Father, I pray for Enon Baptist Church. I know that their search committee has been diligent over these years, last couple of years. We do thank you for those that have filled this pulpit, Brother Messer and others. And Father, now the time has come that they have selected uh, Brother Ben and Lindsay to be this pastoral family, also with their son Benson. And so I pray, Father, that these deacons that are present here and those that will be serving in the, in the future, and some of these will rotate off and others will come on. I pray, Father, for the deacons of this church, that they will work with Pastor Ben, and Father, that they will always keep their focus upon you, upon that cross. And if we never take our eyes off of that, Father, we'll be on the right path. And so I pray that you would uh, be with each of these that are here at the front of this congregation that have been selected to serve, that they will serve you, Father, with all of their heart, that they might bring honor and glory to the name that is above every name, the name of Christ, for it's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. All right, Lindsay, you can be seated. Pastor Ben, if you'll come on up. Um, All right. All right. Children's Church. All right, Brother Ben, if you'll come on up. All right. Isn't that good to see a bunch of kids? Amen. Now, this, this is, I'm, I'm the music while we wait here just for a second. You know, there are some pastors and some people in the church that don't want to hear a baby cry. It's distracting. I love to hear them. Hey, that means there's life out there. Amen? Amen. All right, Brother Ben, come over here. We've got two more things to do, then I'm going to turn you loose, all right? All right. First time I'm going to present you is, is a certificate of your pastoral installation which simply reads, because you have been called by the Lord Jesus Christ and accepted by the prayerful consideration of the members of Enon Baptist Church, we award you this pastor installation to you today beginning March 24, 2024. And I want to say well. Thank you. I look forward to working with you. <laughs> Somebody might want to take a picture. I'm not sure. Let's look this way. Let's look that way. Okay. All right. All right. All right. And, and I usually do this, and y'all, what was here? What was here about two weeks ago, three weeks ago? Pastor Bill was moving; he was he's he's gone. Um, I usually wait till uh, special occasions to do this, but <laughs> and, and and as of all things, the Sunday that you hear, they're gonna eat, amen. <laughs> And so I, I, I'm going to give you just a short training in this after the service. But I want to present you with your very own pastoral fork. Okay? So, uh, <laughs> all right. All right. There you go. Use that right. Okay. All right. What, what, uh, Pastor B said, I never know what you're going to say. I don't either until it comes out. <laughs> Amen. Amen, brother. Thank you, Dennis. Well, I'd like you to take your Bibles this morning and go with me to John chapter 12. I've got to figure out what to do with this now. <laughs> you know, when I, when I went to pastor my first church, my first church, I gained about 15 pounds. My second church, I gained about 40 pounds. And so this ain't looking good. <laughs> so, John chapter 12 this morning, I'm excited. My wife and I were excited about being here with you I can say with all honesty, I've pastored two churches, I've been involved in a lot of ministries, but I have more confidence that God has called us here than any ministry I've ever been a part of. I really sought the Lord and I, I told the Lord, you know, it's funny when we say I told the Lord, but anyway, I told the Lord, uh, I want to know that this is where you want me. And he gave me such clear confirmation. So I'm excited about the future. I know you are too. Uh, I think it was a Adoniram Judson that said, the future is as bright as the promises of God. And that's what we're looking forward to. If you found your place in John chapter 12, let's take just a moment and pray together. 
Father, we thank you that we can come before you, Lord, that you've made a way into your presence through Jesus Christ. Lord, without him, we have, we have no hope. We have nothing, Lord. But Lord, in Christ, we, we take great encouragement, we take great comfort, we take great consolation, knowing that we can come into your presence without fear, without shame, knowing that Jesus has fully paid our sin debt. Lord, not only has he paid our debt, but even now he stands right there beside you interceding for us. And Lord, when you look at us, you see Christ himself, you see the righteousness of Christ. And so Lord, in every way, inside, outside, above, below, Lord, we're surrounded by Christ and we're thankful for it. Lord, I pray as we look in your word today, I pray that you would give a unique anointing from your spirit. Lord, I pray that you would speak to people individually. I pray that people would leave here, even with the tears being squeezed out of them, just knowing that you spoke to them today, knowing they heard from God. Lord, this is yours, this property is yours, the people here are yours, everything's yours anyway. But Lord, we do want to begin this time by just taking our hands off of it now. It's yours. Now, Lord, do with it whatever you want to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Back in 1921, a missionary couple named David and Svea Flood felt called to go to Africa. They went to what was then known as the Belgian Congo, and when they got there, they met up with another young couple, the Ericssons. The two couples began to seek God as to where he wanted them to go specifically, and they felt the Lord leading them to a a little village, a village called Nodlora, a village that hadn't been reached with the gospel yet. It was a remote area, but they packed up their things and they They made their way there. When they arrived, the chief wouldn't let them in the village. He was afraid if he let them in, it would anger the the local gods, so it had nothing to do with them. They went about a half mile past the village up a little slope and built a couple mud huts and started their ministry. For weeks and weeks turned into months, they prayed for spiritual breakthrough, but nothing happened. They had no contact with the tribe. There was, however, one little young boy who was allowed to come up the side of the hill every few days and sell them eggs. So Savea Flood, she was only a four foot eight inch woman, a little woman, but she had a big personality and she decided if I can't talk to anybody but this one boy, I'm going to reach this one boy with the gospel. And in time, she actually did. The little boy became a believer, but that was the only fruit they saw. Meanwhile, as this was all happening, malaria started to strike one member after another of the little, little group. In time, the Ericsons, the other two missionaries, they decided that they'd had enough of this suffering. They were going to go back to the main mission station. They were going to find somewhere else to serve. Around this same time, right as they were leaving, this little woman, Savea Flood, finds herself pregnant. When the time came for her to give birth, there were no other women around. The chief wouldn't let anybody in the village have anything to do with them, but he did soften just enough to send a midwife up there. And up there on the side of that mountain that day she gave birth to a little girl who she named Anya the sad part was though the delivery it was exhausting Svea had already had malaria her body was worn down she got very sick she lasted seven more days and then she died at that moment when he lost his wife something literally snapped inside of David Flood he went out and he took his shovel and he dug a crude shallow grave he took the body of his little 27 year old wife He laid it in that grave, he buried her, he put a little white cross there, and he took his two children and he went back down the mountain. He got back to the mission station and he took his little daughter, Anya, and he handed her to the Ericsons. And he said, I'm going back to Sweden. I've lost my life. I can't take care of this baby. And then he said these words. He said, God has ruined my life. And with that, he headed for the port, got on a boat. He was done with his calling. He was bitter at God. He was through. Within eight months after giving the baby to the Ericsons, both the Ericsons died and the baby was then given to an American missionary couple and they changed her name to Aggie and brought her back to the States. If you fast forward a long way, she grew up, she married a young man in ministry and eventually he ended up serving as the president of a Christian college. One day she went out to her mailbox, little Aggie or Anya, as you might remember, she went out to her mailbox and she found a little Swedish magazine, of all things, a Swedish magazine in her mailbox out in Washington, uh, Washington State. 
Now, she knew a little bit about her own history, and she knew that this is where uh, she was from. So she took the magazine, she flipped through it, and in the magazine she saw the picture of just this little white cross over a crude grave somewhere in Africa. So she couldn't speak the language, she couldn't read the language, so she rushed to the college and found one of the professors who she knew could speak the language. And she said, what's what's this article about? He said, well, it tells the story about this missionary couple that came to the Congo, about this little woman, Svea Flood. She had a baby, she died there, her husband buried her there, and, and this picture is a picture of her grave. After he said all that, He goes on, he says, the article goes on to tell, though, he said, this article tells that she won one little boy to Christ. It was the only boy she ever won to Christ, but she won this one little boy to Christ. And the article goes on to say that he eventually founded a little school in the village. And and not only did he found a little school, but he won all of his students to Christ. And then they turn around and they won their parents to Christ. And he said, this goes on to tell me in this article, there are now 600 villagers, 600 Africans in that village who faithfully follow Christ. Little Aggie or Anya, as we know her, she was amazed because she knew enough of her history to know Sabaya Flood was her mother. She was absolutely just, just knocked back by the whole thing. A few months later, the, the college where they were serving gave her and her husband a trip to Uh, to her homeland, to Sweden. That was going to be their anniversary uh, gift. And so they went, they made the way over there, and she did some research, and she tracked down her father, David Flood, and she found out he had had remarried, he had had more kids now, and she she went, she met her new brothers and sisters for the very first time, and, and she says, I really want to see Dad. And they said, oh, he'd be, he'd be so happy to see you. Then they told her one thing, they said, whatever you do, don't bring up God in his presence. If you even mention God, he will fly off the handle. He's going to go crazy. Just whatever you do, don't mention God. A couple days later, she walked into a little room, a little apartment. There were liquor bottles everywhere. And over in the corner on a shabby old bed was a shabby old man. He was 73 years old by this point, and he had had just ruined his life. He had ruined his body with with alcohol, and here he is laying over there crumpled in a corner. She walks over there, and she lays her hand on his shoulder, and she kind of starts to introduce uh, introduce herself, and he turns towards her, and he looks at her, and he says, Anya, and he starts crying. He says, Anya, I'm so sorry I gave you away. She looked at him, and she said, "It's, it's okay, Papa. God took care of me. When she said that God took care of me, his face became like a stone. He turned back towards the wall and he said, Anya, God is the reason I'm in this shape. God ruined my life. He killed your mother. He ruined my family. He's the one that separated us. He's the reason I'm in this bed. God ruined my life. Don't even talk about him in my presence. Aggie wasn't wasn't deterred though she kept sitting there and she said papa i've got a little story to tell you she pulled out the article from the magazine and she basically read him everything that happened and and as he was laying there hearing the whole rest of the story she looked at him and she said papa jesus loves you jesus never hated you god didn't do all this to you that old man turned he looked back in his daughter's eyes his body relaxed probably for the first time in years and he began to to cry and to talk and by the end of the afternoon David Flood had come back to the God he had resented for so many decades and I told that story to say this David Flood found out that day that just because you don't understand what God is doing doesn't mean he isn't doing anything sometimes it's only farther along that we really understand why There's a couple lines in John's account of the triumphal entry. It's Palm Sunday, so let's turn to the triumphal entry. And there's a couple lines in this triumphal entry that remind us of this reality. Look with me at verse 12. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, and as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. It's verse 16, I really want you to notice. Verse 16 says, His disciples did not understand these things at first. 
His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Therefore the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason the people also met him because they heard he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. I want you to set the picture in your mind. Hundreds if not thousands of people have gathered in Jerusalem for the Passover, for preparation. They're gathering and there's one thing that's on everybody's mind and the one thing is one man, his name is Jesus. And, and the buzz is, is he going to show up? And what's got everyone so stirred up is that this man Jesus has just risen, has just raised somebody from the dead and there are people in town who are eyewitnesses that are spreading it. They're telling everyone. Everyone wants to know, is he coming? Is he going to be here? Is he going to perform a miracle? Suddenly, I don't know exactly how, news came to Jerusalem that Jesus was only a couple miles away in a little, a little town called Bethany. Somebody starts spreading the news that he's heading to Jerusalem. When the people in Jerusalem heard this, they, they went out and they started cutting down palm branches and they, they ran towards Bethany to the descent of the Mount of Olives to, to meet Jesus. Don't you imagine Jesus and his 12 disciples are, are coming down the side of the Mount of Olives. Jesus is riding a, a little colt, a little donkey, and the 12 men are around him. And all of a sudden, over the hill comes this throng of people with these palm branches and, and yelling at the top of their lungs, Hosanna! The word Hosanna literally means come save. They look at Jesus, they really believe that Jesus is God's Messiah. They believe that he's a messenger from God, and they believe that the Messiah is going to deliver them from Rome. So they're literally saying, Hosanna, they're saying, come, be our king, save us from Rome. This crowd gets to Jesus and they, they're waving these palm branches and they surround him and his disciples. And some are crying out, Hosanna. Others are taking their coats off and laying them down in front of the little coat as it walked to show the honor, the aspiration they had for Jesus. Well, as all this is going on, Jesus starts to cry. Because he looks over the city of Jerusalem and he starts to cry and he says, How often I would have gathered you to myself. How often I would have delivered you, but you would not. As all this is happening, they're crying, Hosanna. Jesus is crying. The disciples, you know the disciples were always trying to keep people away from Jesus. The disciples are fighting, trying to keep the crowd from crushing Jesus. And then the Pharisees show up and they start calling out, Tell them to be quiet. How dare them say he's Messiah? How dare them call him Hosanna? Tell them to be quiet. Jesus looks at them and says, if, if they don't say it, the rocks would. All of this is going on. And now they start coming into the city of Jerusalem. And they enter maybe th through one of the gates. They come in and there's sheep everywhere. There's sheep bleeding. That's all you can hear is the mixture of people yelling Hosanna and sheep bleeding. Because thousands of sheep have been herded into the city for the Passover sacrifice. Now, I want you to get all that in your mind because it's in this context that verse 16 appears. The people are running. The people are shouting. They're waving branches. The commotion is distraction. It's deafening. The Pharisees are yelling, make it stop. Jesus is riding on a little donkey and he's crying. So, you know, the disciples are, the Pharisees are over, hollering over here. Jesus is crying back there. I don't know what's wrong with Jesus. I don't know why these people are acting the way they're acting. I mean, their whole life it just turned upside down in a moment. The disciples are probably doing everything they can just trying to protect, protect Jesus from being thrown by the crowd. And it's in that context, verse 16 says, His disciples did not understand these things at first. This event was predicted, the details were prophesied, yet in the, the chaos of this journey into Jerusalem, the disciples didn't get what God was doing. And it wasn't until Jesus rose from the dead, it wasn't until the kingdom had come that the whole thing really started to make sense. You already know this, I don't have to educate you on this, but I will say this morning that there will be things in this life that you will not understand until the kingdom comes. There will be things in this life that you'll never be able to put the pieces together and understand all that God is doing but let me say as well, just like David Flood found out, just because you can't understand what God is doing never gives us a right to think he's not doing anything. Here are these disciples in the chaos, in the madness of the moment. They're surrounded and literally everything around them is shaking and they don't get it. But later, farther along, it all made sense. 
there are three things that I want to quickly show you that were happening that they missed in the madness of the moment. And you will also miss these three things happening in your life if you are not careful in the madness of the moment. Number one, God's purposes were being carried out. Now, I mean this in the most literal way possible. With every step this little cult took. Now, again, the, there's the screams going on. The Pharisees are, are yelling one thing. The, the people are yelling another thing. Jesus is crying. I mean, there's all this chaos going on. But in the most literal way possible, in the middle of this chaos, with every step this little cult took towards Jerusalem, Jesus was being carried toward his destiny. Jesus was being carried towards Calvary. And of course, the crowd didn't get that. They had a, a different purpose in mind for Jesus. They wanted to crown Jesus King of Israel. But the real reason he came was not for a coronation, but for a crucifixion. And though the people didn't understand it, they were right when they called him the King of Israel. He was Israel's king. But he had not come to save Israel with a sword. He had come to save Israel through his own suffering. They cried out, Hosanna, come save. And what they didn't realize is he was doing exactly that at that very moment. However, he was saving them from something worse than slavery to Rome. Jesus was saving them from the slavery of sin. What I want you to see in all this is they're asking God, God, please do this. And God is doing it right in front of them. But they cannot recognize it because he's not doing it the way they meant when they asked for it. See, the reality is their purpose was far lower than his. Their purpose was temporary. They wanted to be saved from Rome. God wanted to save them from their own rebellion. Their purpose was temporary. His was eternal. They wanted him to save them from their oppressors. But he had come to save them from themselves. And here the disciples are. They're trying to fight off the crowd. And there's all this noise. And, and everything's going on. And they don't understand it. But at that very moment. In the middle of that chaos. God is carrying forward his eternal plan for the world. And just let me tell you. In the middle of your chaos. When all the noise is surrounding you. And you can't understand what's going on. I can tell you without any doubt in my mind. That God is carrying forward his eternal plans for you. To the disciples, this whole event was so confusing, it was chaotic. But to Jesus, it was the first step towards the last step of the plan. They did not understand these things at first. But after the resurrection, it all became clear. Can you imagine when they were sitting around the table sometime after the resurrection, after the ascension, and it just clicked for one of them? This was about that. All that that happened that day, why did we not remember? This was all prophesied in the Psalms. You see, it wasn't about the crowd. It wasn't about the chaos. It was actually about the cross. Most of the time in life, we get so focused on the moment that we miss the meaning. We see what's happening, but we do not even have the capacity to recognize what God is doing. So can I say to you, when you see everything falling out of place, that actually may be God putting everything in place. Jonathan Goforth was a young man that felt called to be a missionary to China. He went to uh, college, Knox College in Canada, to train for the ministry. And he thought that everybody there was there for the same reason he was, and they all wanted to serve the Lord. So he decided that he needed to get his assignment real quick of where he was going to serve. So he went to the dean of the school and asked for uh, directions to the worst part of town. He went down to the worst part of town that day, and, and when he got there, all these young women started coming up to him. And they were all so friendly. And they were talking to him and they were, they were telling him that they'd like to be his friend and asking him if he needed anything. And I, he just, he was so amazed. He went back to the school that night and at dinner he said, y'all, you guys, you've got to hear this. God has called me to work in this part of town. I went down there today and the people were so friendly. The girls where I'm from, they all kind of don't even notice I'm there. But every one of these girls was coming up to me and saying, hey, how can I help you? Can I be your friend? Do you need a little company? Everybody around the table got real silent. <laughs> Finally, one of them looked at him and said, Have you never seen a prostitute before? Oh my, he was so embarrassed of what had just happened. He thought he would never, never be one of the in crowd in that group. That night, they enjoyed making fun of him so much, they took a new suit that he went and bought, they cut a hole in it, and they wrapped it around him, and they made him run up and down the hall while they yelled at him. He went back in his room, and he cried, and he cried, and he cried, and he thought, Lord, here I am trying to serve you. Yes, I may be a little naive, but I'm trying to serve you, and I thought I was coming here to learn about you. I thought I was coming here to move forward in ministry, and literally, I got here, and now everything's falling apart. It was a few years later, he was a senior 
he had confirmed that he was going to China as a missionary. But he didn't have any way to get there. He didn't have any funding. One night, a group of those students called him in to the main hall. When he walked into the room, Jonathan found his entire senior class in the room. They all stood up and they started clapping for him. And they said, you know, we thought you would leave after that night. We thought you would fall apart after that night. But the way you've stayed and the way you've been consistent, the way you've served and the way you've led, we've decided God's not called us to be missionaries. He's called us to be pastors. So we're all going to stay here and we're going to raise the funds to send you to China. This was for that. When you see everything going wrong, it might actually be that God's trying to get it right. Number one, God's purposes were being carried out. Now, these next two, you're going to have to listen fast because we're going to have to move quick. (laughs) Number two, God's promises were being kept. Quite some time before this event, the prophet Zechariah had foretold that Israel's Messiah is going to come, and he's going to come riding on a colt. And even though the disciples didn't understand it at that moment, God was at this very moment displaying his power to keep every promise he ever made to his people. Jesus, in this little scene we just read, was delivering on a 500-year-old promise in their presence, but the turmoil of the time blinded them to the fulfillment taking place around them. Let me ask you, and I don't care which channel you watch, do you ever watch the news and wonder, where's all this going to end? I'm going to tell you, okay, I'm going to tell you exactly where it's going to end. It's going to end with Jesus on the throne and every knee on earth and in heaven bowing down before him saying, worthy is the lamb. We look at all the international chaos around us and I'll just be frank with you, international chaos shouldn't alarm us as the people of God. International chaos should actually calm us. What? I say that international chaos should calm us because what we are watching is just the fulfillment of prophecy. And I know sometimes it looks like things are getting out of hand, but I guarantee you it looks like things are getting out of hand, but it's all really just under his thumb. The disciples couldn't see it right then, but they are watching prophecy fulfilled in front of them, and they're so mesmerized by the chaos they don't even notice it. Let me encourage you, don't get so preoccupied with the crowd that you miss the comfort that's to be found in watching God do exactly what he said he would do. We are watching the confirmation of our faith take place in front of us. I think many of us will soon find ourselves saying, just like the disciples did, oh, we we didn't see it then, but it was all so plain. So what's God doing in the madness of the moment? He's fulfilling ancient prophecies. He's keeping every promise he made to his people. That's the shortest point I've ever preached in my life. Number three. (laughs) What's God doing? God's purposes are being carried out. God's promises are being kept. Number three. God's people are being called out. As you look at the end of the scene, as the scene goes on down the road, the Pharisees are left standing there. And as they're left standing there, this parade is processing on. They look at each other and and they, they say to each other, one of them says, you know what? We haven't accomplished a thing. We're accomplishing nothing. The whole world is going after him. There he goes and everyone's behind him. And, and, and the Pharisees look and they say, no, there are more people following him as he's leaving than there were when he was coming. When Jesus came down the mountain, it was only 12. When Jesus entered the city, there were thousands. What's God doing in the chaos? He's building a kingdom. One life at a time. In this chaos, the church grew from 12 to thousands. If you're a follower of Jesus, the things that are going on in your life and around you, they're not even really primarily about you. The opportunities in the chaos is for you to invite others to join the parade and follow him. Let me be very frank. You're not there to get chemo. You're there to tell someone about the faithfulness of Jesus. It's not about an oil change that you've got to stick in on an already busy day. It's about you being able to tell some guy who's struggling that there is a God who actually cares about him and will meet his needs, who loves him, and who has loved him so much he's given his life for him. You see, everything in our life is about people that God wants to redeem. When you're at the bank, when you're at work, when you're on a call, you are there to bring people to him. The disciples couldn't understand that, though, because everything was so chaotic. This puts a new perspective on the chaos in our lives. God does what he does. He puts us in the positions he puts us in to lead others to him. Now back to David and Zvea flood. Aggie went home. David flood died a few weeks later, but that wasn't actually the end of the story. 
Her and her husband went to an evangelism conference in London. A man stood up from the nation of Zaire, which was the former Belgian Congo, and he gave a report. He was the superintendent of the national church there. And he said that in our nation there are now 110,000 baptized believers. He spoke eloquently of the gospel spreading through his nation. He gave this great report. Well, at the end of the meeting, Aggie ran up to him because she just couldn't help herself. And she said, have you ever heard the name David and Zvea Flood? This man with his thick African accent, he looked at her and he said, yes, madam. He said, it was Zvea Flood who led me to Jesus Christ. I was the boy who brought food to your parents before you were born. In fact, to this day, your mother's grave and her memory are honored by all of us. He, he reached out and he hugged her and they hugged for a long time. And as he pushed her away, he looked at her and he said, Do you realize your mother is the most famous person in our country? He invited her to come see the grave. And not long after that, Aggie went to, to Zaire to see her mother's grave. They were welcomed by cheering throngs of villagers. She even met the man who her father had hired to carry her back down the mountain. But the most dramatic moment was when the pastor in the village escorted Aggie to see her mother's little white cross for herself. Aggie came to that sacred space in that little white cross and she knelt down in the soil that, that held her, body, her mother's body, the soil her, her mother had given her life for. She knelt down in that soil to pray and to give thanks to God for what he had done. When Svea Flood took her last breath, she had no idea her one little convert would lead a whole nation to Christ. In the madness of her final moments, she was leading a parade that would end with thousands of Africans gathered at the feet of Jesus. In the chaos, in the madness of the moment, you are not leading the parade, you're part of the parade and you're just inviting others to come and follow him. God has not unleashed chaos on you. He's allowed you to be in the chaos so that you can lead others out. Now, friend, you may not understand it now, but I guarantee you later, probably when the kingdom comes, probably after the resurrection, there will be many things we'll understand why farther on. But for right now, I can say without any doubt in my mind, what's God doing in the chaos right now? God's carrying his purposes forward. God's calling his people out and God's keeping his promises. Farther along, we'll know all about it. Farther along, we'll understand why. So cheer up, my brother. Live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. Will you pray with me? Father, now I pray that you'll take your word and use it to bring comfort, help, hope to the hearts of your people. Lord, people here who are struggling that know you, Lord, I pray that you'd remind them, even though they do not maybe understand everything that's going on in their life right now, that you know what's going on and you are sovereignly directing the events of their life. Lord, there may be a day that they will in eternity be able to understand all the way you are piecing the puzzle together. Lord, I pray that you will comfort people that are suffering. And Lord, I pray for people who may be here this morning that somehow have convinced themselves that they have a right to be mad at you because of something that happened. Lord, I pray that you'd show them with your mercy, your grace this morning. Show them that whatever happened, though they can't understand, it was actually somehow for their good. Lord, I pray that you draw people to yourself in this time of invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I ask Shannon to come, she's going to lead us in a song. I bet you can't guess what the last song is going to be, can you? I want you to stand with me. Now, let me say this. I preached long today than I did last time, but I told you last time that I would reclaim my time next time. (laughs) Shane's going to come and lead us in a song. And and if you you need prayer, if you'd like me to pray with you, or if you'd like to just come spend some time with the Lord yourself down here, I want to assure you, you may not understand everything that's going on, but God does. And one day it'll make sense. And I promise you this, when he shows us the whole picture, it'll be so breathtaking, we'll probably have to just lay down speechless for about a thousand years. Would you stand? Let's sing together these words farther along.
so much for being here today. Thank you for all the kindness, the love you've shown to me and my family already. And I do, again, I think it's worth saying, I want to thank the search team. They put in so much, so much work, so much time. I'm looking at some of you, the ones I can see in here. And uh, they were so kind and, and they're working with me. And uh, so again, uh, don't, don't forget to say thank you to them for the work they put in over the last couple of years. I appreciate it. And I know the, I know the church does too. We're going to close in prayer today. Are there any other, since this is my first Sunday, are there any other announcements that need to be made? Things that maybe we weren't? Business meeting tonight at 6. Uh, Scott's going to be leading that. I'm going to sit and watch. I told him if there are any problems, they all need to be dealt with tonight. <laughs> and <laughs> so, uh, Scott's going to lead that. I kind of want to observe how y'all do things so I can get in the, get in the groove here uh, with you. Thank you so much for being here. My wife and I will stay up here up front today. And if any of you would like to speak to us, we'll be happy to wait around up here for a little while. And then uh, I started my way down this side this week greeting people. I'll start my way down that side next week greeting people. So don't switch sides or I won't get to, I won't get to some people. All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for your kindness and your mercies towards us. Lord, your mercies are new every morning. Lord, we don't even know the fullness of all the mercy you've shown us. So, Lord, we, we just we say thank you. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for the way you have brought us together and to walk together. Lord, we're looking forward to your future. And, Lord, that's what we want it to be. We want it to be your future. God, you do hear what you want to do. And, as Lord, as we just step back and watch it, I believe we'll be amazed at what you do if we just let you. So, Lord, we're looking forward to all you're going to do. Thank you for your kindness today you showed us in our meeting together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here.